good afternoon. I am Gil Cedillo. I'm chair of the Housing Committee for the great city of Los Angeles. We are here today with a special meeting of the Housing Committee Monday, October 19th, 2015, room 1060 City Hall. It's 1.30. Uh, it's actually 1.38. And uh, I am joined by my colleague, Marquise Harris-Dawson, uh, myself. Uh, my colleagues will be joining us shortly. Uh, we have two items before us today. Uh, one is the, you want to announce that? Item one, Mr. Chair, is a HCID report relative to submitting 25 new affordable housing projects into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund pipeline. Okay. Do we want to hear from uh, HCID right now? Senator Price, good to see you. Hi. Good afternoon. Mm -hmm. Manuel Bernal, Director of Housing. George Ian, Housing Finance and Development. Magdalena Zakarian, Housing Finance and Development. Okay. Okay, so we're here to talk about the COFA project's results. Um, I'll give you a brief summary. Uh, in May of, 2020, of 2015, the Mayor and City Council authorized uh, the Department to release the COFA projects to solicit new projects for the affordable housing pipeline. Uh, in addition to that, in March, a little bit earlier, the Mayor also and the Council also authorized us to release a request for projects for three city-owned properties, including Rosa Parks Phase 2. And as a result of both endeavors, SIDLAC, um, the department, is proposing to admit 25 new projects into the existing affordable housing trust fund pipeline. The 25 projects are estimated to total approximately 1,776 affordable housing units over the next two years. 1,776. I repeat that. 1,776. And those will be done? Those will be... A in construction, in construction uh, within the next two dirt, years. Dirt turned within two years. Yes. And then uh, first occupancy? Um, I would say uh, two years after that, or 18 months or two years after that. So it, just to summarize the recommendations that we're asking for, to admit the Affordable Housing Trust Fund Pipeline 24 projects as a result of the call for projects. We also like, are requesting that we admit, that you admit Rosa Parks Phase 2 as a result of the March RFP. Uh, in addition to that, I like, uh, we would request the authorization to negotiate a disposition and develop an agreement with Ward EDC and the related companies as it pertains to that RFP results for Rosa Parks Phase 2. Uh, authorize the Housing Department to issue letters of admittance of, uh, for all 25 projects uh, are included in our report on Tables 1 and 2. Uh, I also would like to clarify that at this particular point in time, we are not recommending any financial commitments. Uh, we will come back for that later. Uh, again, going back into uh, just a brief, a brief um, background. Um, as a result of the initial cover projects back in 2013 and the supplemental cover projects in January 2014, we started the, the that we call that the initial uh, pipeline. We brought in 31 projects at that particular point in time. Uh, of those 31 projects, 18 have already been fully funded and are in construction. Six of which, six additional uh, projects of those 31 are, have, are fully funded now and are gearing up to start construction within the next six months. And then seven of those, the remaining seven, are still in pre-development. Some of them have been delayed for, again, unforeseen reasons. But we expect that uh, five of those will be in construction by 2016. So we're in pretty good shape out of the 31 projects. By next year, we'll pretty much, all of them will pretty much be in construction or fully funded. With that said, then, as we realized that we thought we needed to go ahead and, and uh, admit more projects in the pipeline, and that's why we asked for uh, the authority to release the, uh, the, um, the regulations back in May. Uh, before we, as we, when we came, we asked um, for, uh, to ask for the, uh, the approval. Uh, several, several policy discussions were discussed. Uh, the two big ones were a, a minimum of 300 units per year for permanent supportive housing. That, in terms of target population, that was a policy that was adopted. 
And the second one was meant really to do more geographic dispersion, and that was really to bring in at least 20% of the projects in non-TOD areas, with the remaining being in TOD areas. Again, wanted to make sure that all the city was covered to some, to a certain extent, while still balancing our TOD um, focus w uh, throughout the city. So those were the policy directives as of May of 2015. We went ahead and applied those regulations immediately and released an RFA call for projects back in May of 20, uh, May 22nd. Um, we had a deadline of Ju uh, June 29th for people to apply. We received 27 applications uh, as a result of that. Our staff reviewed the applications uh, and sorted them based on the, uh, the criteria that, I, uh, that was included in the regulations and the priorities. Um, by August 21st, we actually had released our initial verified scores to the to the applicants, and uh, we we um, we received 15 appeals. Uh, we heard those appeals, and uh, we actually granted 12 of those appeals. So we had an, uh, an extensive appeals process, gave people a chance to respond back. Once the final scores were were uh, were uh, settled, we sorted them based on the the criteria that I mentioned in, right uh, at the beginning. Again, we wanted to make sure that we address the non-supportive, non-TOD projects and uh, elected some of those. So we took the first uh, 20, 20 percent, uh, turned out to be around five projects, five non-TOD projects consisting of approximately 412 units. Uh, the second sort had to do with permit supportive housing. We want to make sure we had bring in at least 300 units of, uh, of permit supportive housing per year. Uh, we received um, eight total applications, or nine total applications for permanent supportive housing, one of which did not meet thresholds, so we were actually bringing in those, those six applications, totaling 525 units. And then finally, the remaining 785 units are TOD uh, projects within 11, 11 developments. In addition to that, of course, we also simultaneously re uh, reviewed the RFP for Rosa Parks, and uh, and uh, we, we are recommending that we bring in uh, the, the, the sole respondent, which was Ward EDC and, and uh, a joint venture with the related companies. Uh, um, so just to summarize it all, we're talking about 25 projects, uh, seven of which are non-TOD, 18 of which are TOD. Uh, one more time, uh, we're talking about 1,776 units of affordable housing throughout the next two years, 525 of which will be permanent supportive housing, six, 262 seniors, and 989 in families, uh, family projects. That's a combined total of uh, $709 million in total development costs. We think that we can put in around $55 million in our own housing trust funds, but that uh, means it's also going to leverage around $363 million in tax credits and an additional $291,000 in other sources. So a lot of leveraging taking place from outside the sources to develop these projects. One point that I'd like to make is that, uh, again, I mentioned that uh, we believe that around $55 million of our own money is going to be required uh, based on the most recent projections, assuming the, uh, the a, a potential 93% cut in home. Our resources right now look at around 35 million, so we have we may have a 20 million dollar gap. Uh, we're hoping that that could be filled by either additional home program income, CRA program income, or some general funds, perhaps um, some some other outside sources as well. Um, but we think it's a good idea to bring in all of them because if we don't, then we may lose out on some of the tax credit equity that's been set aside for the city. So better to be prepared. Finally, a couple of points of interest that I'd like to make. Um, $63 million uh, are being uh, tapped as, um, or are being targeted for the, the, um, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Funding, which is the state, is one of the most uh, uh, abundant sources of financing right now. So we have, of the 25 projects, we think we can get around $63 million over the next two years, which is a good thing. Uh, and then finally, three out of the 25 projects are within the Promise Zone. Uh, that's uh, the, uh, the Pico, Union, Koreatown, West Lake Hollywood, and East Hollywood area. Uh, and uh, that would be MacArthur Park Phase B, MacArthur um, Metro, Path Metro Villas, and Westmore Ellen. So three, three projects within the Promise Zone, which again, I think is a good thing. So I'll stop there. Uh, I think that uh, I talked a little too much. 
but uh, Maggie wants to brief a little bit on that. There's a master calendar that we've worked with the community to talk to uh, that we would like to add to this transmittal. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, master calendar was passed out as addendum to the transmittal that was just discussed, and it is for information purposes only. Uh, Master Calendar was prepared in uh, Housing Department in collaboration with uh, Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing, uh, established 2016-2018 Affordable Housing Trust Fund Pipeline Master Calendar. The objective of the calendar is to be consistent with uh, regulation uh, with our uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund regulations, call for projects process and. Uh, California Tax Credit Allocation Committee application rounds. By establishing that calendar, we hope to create more uh, certainty and predictability between a housing department and uh, between development community and have better opportunity for planning. Uh, yes, that's it. For That's it. So, uh, we are open for questions you may have. Colleagues. Questions? Ready? Ready, ready? ready? Okay. Uh, and the only question would be, how can we ex expedite and ex accelerate this? You don't have to answer that now, but we are prepared to do all that we can. Uh, we're very excited that 1,700 plus units will be uh, coming online. We like the timeline, but there is such a great need that we really want to do all that we can to to do anything that we can to expedite this process and make sure we get these all online. Um, we are too and one of, the, one of the things we could do is actually some of these 25 projects may be shifted over to our 4% line which would expedite the process in those. So funding being available or more funding being available that's our, our, our quick way of getting uh, units in the books. So we'll be looking at that uh, in the near future. Great. A motion? Move. Move. So we have public comment. Uh, Patricia McAllister and uh, Stephanie Klasky Games Gomez Games Gamer. Gamer. <laughs> Good afternoon. I'm Patricia McAllister. I did go over this, and I'm just appalled to see that 95 percent of these projects are in heavily illegal alien areas. So I don't think we should be housing and affordable housing illegal aliens, and then I see a lot of Asian communities. I see uh, West Angeles down here once. That's a predominantly, I hope, black constituent. Once. Uh, uh, once illegal. Excuse me, uh, you're taking my time. So I, 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 I'm, I'm very concerned about this, and you're rushing this through. Uh, all of this money, plus some of these projects, after you bring them in as affordable, they switch over into uh, uh, regular housing. They change their level from affordable, saying that the area or district has changed. And if you please don't turn your back on me, sir, we can vote you out of office. Only 20% of the people are voting. And that's very disrespectful. You're, you're the chair of this uh, District 1 here, and you're turning your back on me. We don't need housing for illegal aliens. We need Thank it for you. Americans and especially African Americans. Stephanie Klasky Gamer, please. Please, please, please. Hi, I'm Stephanie Klasky Gamer with LA Family Housing, and I really was just here to say thank you. I was one thank of you. those 31 original uh, projects that came in when the pipeline opened, call for projects opened in 2013. And when we walked in the door, we said, we've got a long range project for the San Fernando Valley. It was part of a 10 year vision. And we needed to have some, uh, we, we needed to have some predictability. With this was a long range project, but we were leveraging $33 million against the city's contribution. And the city staff from HCID our elected officers in the San Fernando Valley all stepped up to help us provide the service home for coordinated entry in the San Fernando Valley, to build a new homeless health care clinic, and to build new permanent supportive housing. And we were able to do that with support from uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund through the managed pipeline. So I really just wanted to say thank you. And that was it. Look at that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Alan Greenlee. Good 
afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Alan Greenlee. I'm the Executive Director of the Southern California Association of Nonprofit Housing. Very quickly, I want to uh, express my appreciation for the committee and for the Housing Department for their great collaborative work that they've done on this managed pipeline. 1,700 units is great, but we've got a long way to go still, as you guys know. Um, specifically, I want to talk a little bit, just very shortly, about this calendar. The calendar was a labor of love built out of the last hearing when, when uh, we were talking about opening the, the pipeline. And, and what the calendar does, I think, is really put a hard commitment on this notion of transparency and consistency. Um, you know, if it's at all possible, we'd love to look at the committee looking at some sort of formal recognition of the calendar, um, just because I think it uh, really puts into place some real discipline, not only from the development community, but from the department and, quite frankly, even the city council. So thank you so much. Okay, so we move to, or the, the vote has been, and we'll open the roll for Mr. Fuentes, uh, to approve the HCID report as amended and to include the master calendar. Good. So the order. Okay, great. Item number two. Mr. Chair, item number two is a CLA report relative to the status of the CDBG projects and of count fund balances, timeliness of expenditures, and recommendations for reprogramming. My name is Clay McCarter with the CLA's office, and I'll be happy to present this report. Last month, the Housing Department reported that the city was in violation of HUD's CDBG timeliness rule, meaning that the city had too much CDBG resources on hand. According to the Housing Department, and the city would need to spend an additional $14.3 million, assuming the expenditure rate to meet this timeliness test by January 30th, 2016. The CLA's office has identified $23.6 million in reprogramming and expenditures in order to ensure the city meets this test. The housing department had recommended that we reprogram and expend $20 million to ensure that we meet this test because not all the dollars would be getting out exactly on time. But our office, in, in trying to make sure that the city has the best chance to avoid failing this test, we recommend the 23.6 be reprogrammed and expended. Of the $23.6 million identified in attachment one, 10.9 million of it is identified as priority projects that would receive funding in future con plan budgets. And that priority list is listed in attachment four. The balance of the funding includes program savings and projects that have been closed out. Attachment 2 shows the expenditures of these reprogrammed funds, and we've divided the expenditures into Tier 1 and Tier 2. The plan would be to spend Tier 1 projects first. Tier 1 includes five affordable housing projects that would use CDBG funding instead of home dollars for property acquisition. And by doing this, we're able to move CDBG funds out by January 30th and free up additional home dollars to the amount of $9.3 million that can be used to address the affordable housing trust fund gap that was discussed in item number one. In order to ensure that expenditures occur by the end of January, we are recommending that by December 15th, if a tier one project will not be able to meet this deadline, the council authorize the reprogramming of those funds and move them to tier two expenditures. Tier two projects involve CDBG loan payments that can be made early. Doing so would save the city interest and freeing up future budget resources for CDBG. So with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Okay. Uh, my notes tell me I've got a CD1 street improvements which are being reprogrammed uh, in the CDBG priority projects. I want to make this part of a change. Yes, we can do that. Thank you. <coughs> any other members? Mr. Wiesar. Thank you. I'm not sure if this is appropriate or if it's been corrected, but there are some Ball Heights Employment Training Center dollars that are being reprogrammed, and um, it's recommended that we go to the reprogram general pool. However, um, we were told just now that uh, those dollars are still being used and that they shouldn't be reprogrammed. Oh, okay. We, we were... Okay. We can um, did you talk to the department or yeah we, we spoke with the department and they informed us that um, all the money had been paid out on that account 
and the remaining 117,000, I believe, was was project savings. Okay, uh, so my staff just told me otherwise, so um, I wasn't clear on exactly what it was, but. Um, and we can work with your office to to determine you, if that was an error. We can we can. Can you look it. at that before you, yes. it's approved in council? The yes. department just told us this morning that um, okay. those dollars are. And still that's for the the Boyle Heights. Um, the money was actually the money was reprogrammed a while back to the Ball Heights neighborhood city hall when that was being completed, and those dollars are still needed. Okay, we'll work for your with your staff to. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thanks for for the report and for the um, the reallocation. I guess is probably one way to put it. Uh, explain again though what happens with these tier one projects that aren't. That can't get done for some reason. They they go into right. So the tier one, tier two, and back in line, or what does that mean? So tier one projects, we're trying to move this money by the end of January, and we will do our very best to make sure that these tier one projects move out the door by then. By December fifteenth, we will reevaluate the tier one projects, and if there's an indication that they cannot meet the January thirtieth deadline, then we would start looking at reprogramming options to move the money to a tier two project, which we know can move. This would be paying off Section 108 debt, and that would save interest costs and, and free up, because the, some of these 108 loans, we have to budget for, for the loan What, what percentage of expenditures are, are required to we haven't, satisfy? Or we haven't by? set what that test would be. It would most likely be if, if the project was not in contract. If the project was in a contract, then it would be very difficult to reprogram the funds. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. So um, the directive requests the mayor, HCID, and the CLA to identify funds for these priority projects. If your project gets moved, uh, there isn't a guarantee that it will be funded. Are you referring to the Tier 1 project? Uh, yes. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so how do you get in line to make sure that you do get funded? If, if it... So I mean, I heard you answer, Mr. Price, is that if there were a contract, is that? Uh, yes, if it was in a contract, then it would most likely not be, be able to be reprogrammed because it was in a, locked in a contract. Okay. How does this reprogramming impact the 42nd Conyer plan? So, I, I mean, it's almost as if these reprogram projects, we'd have to resubmit them. You, you as, would. As, yeah. as, as new projects, yet they've already been in the queue, but they're going to be reprogrammed. So it's not. They, they would need to be. Re so it, talking about a tier one project, if it, if for some reason it, it wasn't able to move in time, and it was reprogrammed, come December fifteenth, then it would have to be reevaluated for forty two. Okay, and so the same rings true for tier two projects. I mean, so it, w when you run through the tier ones and whatever makes it makes it, then you're going to go to tier two. The tier two is more of a safety gap. It just and we're just trying to ensure that the city. Did, meets this test. Sure. So at the end of the day, in December, if we need to move dollars, then we would look towards Tier 2. So Tier 1 really, I mean, it, it, it's closer to equaling $10.9 million? Uh, the, the Tier 1 projects actually total the, the full 23.6. Okay. So we're going to try and spend all of the 23.6 right off the bat. Whatever can't move by December 15th, we'll look at for moving to Tier 2. Got it. And you, you mentioned, uh, for example, in Tier 1, so you're going to uh, backfill, not backfill, you're going to Fill uh, the. Uh, you're going to use home funds. Yes. Yeah, so the, the there's in tier one there are five affordable housing projects, and the home funds we're supposed to, we're going to be used for the property acquisition, where we're actually going to swap and use CDBG, so we can spend the CDBG down. But when you get the and home funds we're gonna, back, we're going to put the home funds towards the pipeline gap. Okay. So presumably those uh, projects that had home funds. Uh, and you're going to use CDBG dollars. I mean, so you're spending, I, I get it's a strategy to spend down the money, but mm -hmm. that's going to make it so that you're going to lose some Tier 1 projects. We, we wouldn't, no, we wouldn't lose, because the, the, the five affordable housing projects are part of Tier 1, so we would free up the home dollars, and the home dollars would be, would be used to accelerate projects in the pipeline. Got it. All right. Thank you. Okay. Public comment. Patricia McAllister. I, I don't like the fact that my tax dollars are being used to, to build housing or uh, allocate affordable housing, 82 units here in MacArthur Park, when we know those are illegal aliens over there, out there illegally selling their goods, vendors on the street. Uh, I think we need a federal investigation of this entire committee here. 
uh, we have a, a, a thousands of people on skid row on the street. And it says here that the CDBG is to allocate money and housing for people who need housing. You've got people living in boxes about five blocks from here, and you haven't done a darn thing for them. I don't see them on here getting some affordable housing built. I say we're going to have to do the right thing. We're going to have to do the right thing, okay? I'm not responsible for this. I'm just here giving you the message. But we got to get these black people off the street. Those are my people. And we need them in affordable housing. Get these illegal aliens out of this country. Stephanie Klasky Gammer. I apologize. I misunderstood what the uh, item was. Mm -hmm. um, so my only comment is LA Family Housing, the same campus project that the pipeline has supported the permanent support of housing in order to build the CES service home. Um, we have an application in for CDBG funds. So I was just bringing that to the committee's attention, but that's not what the item was about. So thank you for your time. Okay, well, thank you. Um, we have a recommendation to approve the CLA report as amended and to include CD1 street improvements. Uh, in addition, instruct HCID to report back on the status of reprogramming in January. Does that work? So moved. That includes your concern, and they'll work with you before it gets to the floor. Second. So move. Second. So be the order. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Yeah, that uh, covers our agenda. No, no comments. All right. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>